You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to If You Know Mary, You Know Jesus. Hi there, everyone. It's good to be back. I just got back from uh, my Christmas uh, vacation in between semesters here. I went down to North Carolina and South Carolina. Had a wonderful time with my brother and sister-in-law, so we're back now, but the semester has also started, and as always, as a seminarian, it's a little, you just got to uh, get familiar with everything. There's a lot of uh, loose ends that you got to tie together. It just takes time, but glad to be back, and we're going to continue with our series on the deadly sins. Um, we completed pride, lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, anger, and today we're going to talk about envy. And I have my good friend Robert with me. Hello there, Robert. Hello, Robert. Thank you for joining us, and uh, he'll uh, fill us in on the um, what we need to know about the deadly sin of envy. <clears throat> so I do have a scripture that I'd like to read um, first. But what we'll do is, um, as we continue with this, let's start with a prayer, as we always do, to begin the show, and let our beautiful Queen Mother... Who, has, who now is assumed into heaven. She guided the church in its early days after Jesus ascended, and she was to God in his great wisdom deemed for her to remain, to do what? To strengthen, pray for, be an example, to guide, to nurture, to teach, to teach the apostles, the first apostles, the apostles um, in Jesus' day. This was huge because God wanted to, um, the, his church was being born at that time. It was in its infancy and needed the strength and the guidance of the wisdom seed itself. Mary, Queen Mother of God, Queen of the Angels, Queen of Humanity. So we look to her for her intercession and we call upon you, dear Mother, to be with us in a very powerful way, and guide this show. This is for the glory of God. I don't care about nothing else. I really don't. And for the good of souls, and hoping that those who listen will, be, will have their hearts open and minds open, and, bring, and it would draw them to the heart of Jesus, draw them where, and to discover that that's exactly what every human heart is longing for is that intimate union with the heart of Jesus. Who is Jesus? He's our God. He's our creator. He's the one who loves us with an infinite love. He's the one who should be the apple of our eye, the beloved of our souls, our big brother, our best and dearest friend. Why? Because that's what he is. That's what we cre he created us for, to have a family. Jesus is our eldest brother. And you know something? I can't think of better words of my relationship with Jesus ever since it's been growing. And I, may, I made a serious commitment to, to, um, to enhance, to grow, to solidify, to strengthen my relationship with my dearest friend, my best and dearest friend, Jesus, my big brother whom I look up to, is every day with our Lord is a blast. I don't know how to put that. Jesus, God is not something boring where he's telling you to do this, don't do that. And he just, he's just back there and it's somewhere where um, no, he's, just, he's just in the shadows, just watching over everything and couldn't care less about it. No. Our Lord Jesus is a blast, and you will have such a blast with God. I'm not kidding. In a good way, in a holy way. It is an adventure that is mind-boggling. And, and true joy rests in the heart of Jesus, in relationship with Jesus. And Our Lady is going to bring us there. And I'll tell you a story, uh, just a quick story, just to give a taste for what, who Jesus is and the kind of God that we, and the kind of friend that we have, an adventurous friend, Jesus. And he wants to share that with us, and he wants us to share that great adventure that, that God from all eternity in his whole, in his creation and in his world, if you will, in his paradisal world. So before we do that, we thank you, dear Mother, and please pray for us. St. Joseph, be with us in a very powerful way. 
uh, with St. Michael, St. Gabriel, St. Raphael, and all the holy angels, and, and the souls in purgatory as well. And uh, for these uh, petitions, uh, may God, in his great mercy, fulfill them all. In his holy name we pray. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis, peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. So this little story here I, I got from a friend of mine, a wonderful, wonderful friend. She uh, had a major conversion. I won't go into the details because I did not get her permission, but a major conversion from a different kind of faith. Major she was hearing the voice of Jesus. She didn't think Jesus was God, but he proved it to her in a very powerful way. Now Jesus is the apple of her eye, the very center, the core of her being now. She puts Jesus at the core of her being, the beloved of her soul, and for good reason. So she tells her story. She says, you know, I saw myself in the midst of chaos in the streets, in a city, and I was standing in the middle of that city, and there was chaos all around me. And all of a sudden, this, this uh, handsome man on a white horse came galloping toward me. And he grabbed me and threw me on the back of the horse. And it was Jesus. It was Jesus. And he, we rode out of that chaos. He, it was like my knight in shining army, armor. But our beloved Jesus cares for us so much that that's what he does. He's amongst us, and he loves us that much. And he will, we, he will rescue us out of every danger if we only let him. If we only surrender our self-will, our false little self-worlds, made worlds, is a false reality, most of us, that we create. Just surrender it to him. And say, Jesus, I give you my heart. And don't be afraid. Man, you will be in for, how do I put it, one of the most exciting, adventurous, romantic adventures that you can imagine. But that's our Jesus. Get to know him. Do not waste time. Get to know God. Don't be afraid. You will discover that everything that, well, not you know, me, well, I'll give you my my own experience, everything that I thought of Jesus was totally wrong. And then once I got to know him, he just showed me who he really is. He's just an incredible, awesome, loving friend who was always there by your side. When my mother died, was, well, during her dying hours, I literally, when I was praying the rosary, literally felt Jesus in my heart give me the warmest, the biggest embrace the biggest embrace in my heart, and I knew it was Jesus. And he let me feel that he was my biggest, he was my big brother and my best and dearest friend. And he said, Bob, don't worry. I've got your mother in the palm of my hands. I'm taking care of her. I said, thank you, Jesus. That's who he is. Go get to know him. He loves you, and he's your best friend, and he will, he will, make, he will rightly order your lives, and you'll be so much happier, more fulfilled and content. And he's so merciful. So I hope that inspires everyone. Um, it certainly inspires me. I'll be praying for all of you, too. Please pray for me and Robert. We need your prayers as well. So it's envy, Robert. Envy. And um, if I yes, just may envy. read... Yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to read the, the... I'm sorry? Go ahead. Um, yeah, I just want to read go... a brief uh, definition that the Catholic Catechism gives, and then I'll... I'll give you the floor, all right, if I please, may. Please, Robert. All right, so this is the Catholic Catechism. It says, envy is sadness or desire for the possessions, happiness, talents, or abilities of another. Envy can lead to the worst of crimes. Through the devil's envy, death entered into the world. Okay, Robert. Thank you. Yes. Um, <clears throat> what, I, what I wanted to say when you were saying that about the white horse, um, yep. with the with the young lady that Jesus had rescued, 
it's almost like the young ladies, uh, the church, like us. And um, yes. And when he pulls us up on the back of that horse, he's it's the word of God, immersed in the way, which is the Holy Cross. And yeah. as we as we come up on that cross, and and Jesus is continuing to ride, and then he, what does he say? He says, "I make all things new." Amen. I make all things new. So in doing this, um, in order to be able to um, reach up to that arm that grabs us and permits us to also take a share in that suffering, that sacrifice, which is no matter how minute it is, which because we're of a fallen human nature, it's very minute. But through our Blessed Mother, she, she makes it look so much better. And he, and he reaches down with a greater love when he, when he sees us crying out to his dear mother to help us. So in order to do that, we have to understand what these deadly sins are. And so we'll start um, by explaining um, envy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. One might ask, where does envy come from? It comes from pride and also from our will that refuses to cooperate with the grace of God. We must realize what comes from the deadly sin of envy. For, sin, for certain, it leads to hatred, but it is also leads to calumny and detraction. Reflect on our life. Have we ever been envious or jealous of another who possesses more riches than us? Have we ever been envious or jealous of another's physical beauty? Have we ever been jealous of another one's temporal or spiritual gifts? Have we ever been jealous of those who are popular? If we have answered yes to any of these questions, then undoubtedly we are in the deadly sin of envy. The envious brother or sister will rejoice over another one's misfortune and will distress if they become successful. My brothers and sisters, enter into envy without understanding of the spiritual sickness that, is ca that it causes. What comes from envy? Without a doubt, it is hatred, strife, contention, cruelty, backbiting, persecutions, contempt, jealousy, gossip, arguments, malice, harboring grudges, and even murder. Envy is, a, envy is a vice that in itself goes against the nature of God. Therefore, when we live in envy, we reject God's grace, bringing only sadness to our own soul. The envious one will seek power or to be right over the one he or she envies. When an envious brother or sister sees the good and wholesome qualities of the one he or she envies, it will bring them despair, for the envious one always wants the one they envy to fail. The envious one will seek to destroy the one they envy. In a trial or tribula if a trial or tribulation falls upon the one they envy, with their whole heart they will rejoice. Sometimes not to be seen on the surface, but within them, they are filled with unjust joy. The envious one will allow his or her emotions to lead them to do evil. They will many times dis disguise it as if they were trying to do good. The envious one will say, do, or expose any faults that they know or hear about the one they envy. Most times, the envious ones want to be seen as the righteous. Thus, they feel no shame when they injure another in their words, deeds, or actions. Without a doubt, envy destroys love of God and love of neighbor. Also, it would keep us from advancing in perfection. We must remember how our Lord called us to live. Love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and with all your soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. When we envy another, we reject these two great commandments of our Lord Christ Jesus, which renders us hateful to God. We must examine ourselves completely and without malice in our heart. 
For many times pride can blind us, which will not allow us to see the envy which dwells within our heart. Thus, when we examine ourselves, we must, we must pray for humility and gentleness, for they are the keys that remove the cage of the deadly sin of envy. My brothers and sisters, reflect back on the crucifixion and how our glorious Lord suffered for us, that by his death we can be set free from sin and be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Look at the two thieves that were crucified with him, though they were both were guilty of their charges. With our Lord they traveled different roads. One of, the th- see, one of the thieves in his envy and pride rebuked our Lord, and the other in humility and gentleness render unto our Lord with kindness. We must remember the scripture of the crucifixion. In one of those robbers who were hanged, blaspheming him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Neither dost thou fear God, seeing thou art condemned under the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, but we receive the due, the due reward of our deeds. But this man had done no evil. And he said to Jesus, Lord, Remember me when thou shalt come into thy kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Amen, I say to thee, This day thou wilt be with me in paradise. How sad it is today that so many ridicule, ridicule, mock, and despise others from the sin of envy. It would be good for all of us to remember what God seeks from us, which is holiness then with all our heart seek to keep within our heart this holiness. For we do not know the hour of our judgment. To combat envy, we must live a virtuous life of gentleness. This means we must be happy for those who have been blessed with wealth, both spiritually and physically. For we must understand many times those who possess wealth find the journey to the kingdom of heaven much more difficult. And those with spiritual wealth many times suffer greatly for the kingdom of God. God has made us in the light of his image and likeness. He has made our neighbor in his own image. Therefore, treat everyone, everyone with the utmost respect and gentleness. We must let kindness break through our moments of envy so that God can bless us with peace, love, and joy. Amen. Beautiful, beautiful meditation, Robert. Is there anything you want to add that as you were reading that, that comes to mind. Um, otherwise, I have a beautiful scripture I'd like to read um, that will help us, I believe, with the sin of envy. Yes, I was. Um, something struck me uh, um, in the part. But if you want to read that, Bob, I'll, I'm going to get back to it here. But 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 go ahead, read what you have now, and I'll be looking back at that. <clears throat> okay. Go ahead. All right, fantastic. <clears throat> all right, so first of all, I'd like to say that Jesus is the pearl of great price. Once the human soul discovers that pearl of great price, Scripture teaches us that we will go and sell everything to attain, obtain that pearl. Why? Because I found my contentment. I found what I am all about. I found the source of all goodness that's going to satisfy my hunger and desire to become fully human, who, I, who God wants me to be, the true person that I am. But Jesus is our big brother, and we are his bro- little brothers and little sisters. But Jesus, God, from all eternity, before I knitted you in your mother's womb, I knew you. God from all eternity knew us. We've been in the mind and heart of God for all eternity. Can you imagine? And he, he actualizes our existence. 
and he actualizes our perfection. We all desire to be perfected in God. And that's why Jesus is the pearl of great price. And if once we discover that, we won't envy anybody because God will satisfy all the gifts, talents. He will perfect you and I as that perfect being that he planned from all eternity. You see, and when we don't have Jesus, well, of course we're going to envy others. We're going to want what they want because we're starving to death. We're starving what we should have for what we should have. But Jesus satisfies that, you see, because he's God. He's an infinite God. He is the source of all being, the source of all goodness, the source of all life, the source of all mercy, the source of all knowledge, the source of all wisdom. I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me so that we could drink from the sap of the vine, the life-giving water, and it never runs dry, you see? So that's I believe, is, is one major answer to the sin of envy, when we're satisfied in Jesus, when we make him the center of our being, the center of our life, he satisfies all that we are lacking. He satisfies all of our desires and hungers and appetites. Yes, it's going to take work. We're going to fall back from time to time, but Jesus says, just pick yourself back up. Um, make yourself available to my mercy. Just to make an appeal to my mercy. Even if you fall, Jesus tells St. Faustina, I will, and you make an appeal to my mercy after your fall, I will grace you even more abundantly had you not fallen. So God is a good God. He's very generous. And he's doing everything in his power to help us to realize his great truth. So this is the scripture that I picked. It's Matthew's Gospel 13. Uh, verses 44 through 47, okay? Parable, parables about the kingdom. Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Why? Because he discovered what his whole being has been desiring and hungering for all of his life or her life. When we don't know this, of course, we're going, to sati we're going to try to satisfy those appetites and hungers with something else. We're going to fill it with spiritual popcorn, if you will, just to sat It's almost like we're using these sex sinful pleasures, whether it's sinful sex, uh, whether it's pornography, drugs, alcohol, um, even overeating, all of these, the deadly sins, the, the sins, that, uh, the, the appetites we're trying to satisfy through the deadly sins is what we're going after. The problem with these things, it always leads to great emptiness because most of the time these things that we're satisfying that hunger with, which is a real hunger for God, leads us to emptiness, but it will eventually lead us to death, which we don't want, you see. You know, it's just like an alcoholic. If, if an alcoholic refuses to admit he's, he or she is an alcoholic, they'll never get well. But eventually the alcohol will kill them. It's not a good. It's a seemingly good thing. It seems good or perceived good, but it is not. Alcohol in and of itself is a good thing, but in, in moderation, you know, but if you're an alcoholic and have an addiction, then I don't care how much alcohol you drink. You can't even drink it in moderation. You need to eliminate it from the rest of your life with the help of God's grace. So anyways, going back to Scripture. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net which was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into the vessels, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the close of this age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Sounds harsh, but these aren't my words. 
These are words of an infinite, all-powerful God. But he's trying to snap us out of it, to, uh, to renounce the world, the flesh, and the devil, to do everything in our power to turn toward Jesus, who will heal us of all these addictions if we only let him in his infinite mercy. But we must realize that these things that were satisfying this hunger for God, with all the deadly sins and all the, the sinful pleasures that go along with that, if we don't renounce it and turn from that, it could lead to eternal death. This is the reality. So we're hoping that we inspire you and we're given a teaching to at least put, plant that seed for conversion. The gospel message is an urgent message to convert, to turn 180 degrees toward our Lord, but you can't do it alone. We're here to help you. We will pray for you. We, uh, we'll put you on all of our prayer lines, whoever you may be. But make an effort to decide for Jesus now. Look to Our Lady. Look to the uh, holy angels. Look to any saint. Go inside a church. Just sit before the Blessed Sacrament and say, Lord, help my unbelief. If you truly are here, show me, Jesus. I guarantee you, he'll show you. Go ahead, Robert. Yeah, and, um, and, and the other thing to focus on also, it's almost like uh, breaking the Ten, Ten Commandments you know, we put a rope, uh, you know, right into hell. And uh, every deadly sin has a rope, and every breaking of the can- uh, commandments has a rope, and it's always pulling us down, down to hell. And it's almost like into that fire. And I want to read something right here, and, and, and you can think yeah. about this. Once we go towards God, there's no turning back. It's either going, going forward, going uphill, or there's no resting, there's no lukewarmness, or it's going down. It's all or nothing. So it's just that true fear of the Lord. We don't want to lose the great gift. When you um, come into your conversion and you feel God's love, that's like that honeymoon towards God. He'll, he'll give you that to enable you to experience and feel his love and his grace. Right. Um, but, but if we, we are tempted to step back and, and, and look back <clears throat> at Sodom, at Sodom, we'll turn that pillar of salt but uh, and uh, and and remember that we don't want to be pulled into that fire. And if you notice, like California was on fire, what's God saying to our nation? The whole West was on fire. And now I'll, I'll read this. Yeah. My, my brothers and sisters, consider the following story: There was a furious fire that raged across a certain land. All the brothers that were trained to fight the fire and extinguish the fire were sent out to make battle against it. There was a great fear for the fire threatened even to burn down many homes. The firemen worked day and night, and finally they extinguished the fire. The labor was hard, but they were able to stop the fire just short of burning down homes. But because of their weariness, they became neglectful, for they did not check for the small coals that might not that were still hot. A strong wind uh, rose up from the west. And within a moment, a flicker of disaster appeared, and the fire reunited and burned down many homes where lives were lost. My brothers and sisters, it is the same with us. Leaving the littlest opportunity for the devil, he will exploit us, for he desires our souls and and will be relentless in his pursuit to get them. Thus, we must cut our bonds with sin completely and thoroughly. But we must extinguish the fire of our temptations through the means of prayer and fasting. We, we cannot make compromises. For we, when we make compromises with sin, we find ourselves so lost in a raging firestorm that the devil is causing in our world today. All one must do is look at the world today, and we will find many of us consumed by our sins. And even when we want to get free from them, sadly, we find ourselves entangled by a numerous number of sins that we are keeping or seeking. Remember, our Lord is merciful, as he was to St. Peter. And no matter what we have done, we still can be forgiven in the sacrament of reconciliation. After receiving this merciful cleansing of our souls, we pray continuously for the grace to overcome ourselves, as St. Peter did. Continue, Robert. 
Amen. Thank you, Robert. Beautiful, beautiful teaching. What I'd like to add, too, is, yeah, yes, um, you know, we must never turn back. You can turn into that pillar of salt as depicted in the days of Lot. His wife turned back. She turned to the pillar of salt. But keep in mind, and, and you said something very key in that reading, Robert, that you, remember, our Lord is very merciful. So you can always turn back to our Lord and keep that in mind. He will always extend his mercy as long as you turn back with a sincere, repentant heart, a contrite heart. And I would say even secure it with Jesus by saying, Lord Jesus, I don't know what it means. I don't know where I'm heading with you, but I'm deciding for you right now. I know I need to decide for you. I choose you this moment, Jesus. You take over. I don't know where it's going to take me. I don't care. But never, ever let me be separated from you, Jesus. Just say it. Just tell him. He will make it happen. Even if you fall and are tempted to turn, and even if you fall into that temptation and turn, he will seek you out until he finds you again. Because you asked him. That's all it is. Just give him that permission. It's amazing how much our Lord loves you. Just give him the permission to take over all that you are and have, and you'll, be, you'll shoot up like a rocket, I guarantee. That was my prayer, especially when I was hurting in my, in my life of uh, like St. Augustine, living like the prodigal son with all these wine, women, and songs, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I thought that's where my happiness was. No way. It brought me to such despair and such pain and such emptiness. So I finally said, Lord, one day I sat up in bed and I thought to myself, Jesus, if I don't go all the way with you, I'm going to lose my soul. And I know it. Because my will and my way of doing things is killing me. Therefore, Jesus, I, this very day, this very night, I choose you, Lord. And I mean that. I don't know what it means, but I'm giving it over to you. Make it happen, Jesus. And man, let me tell you, he swept me off my feet. I just gave him that permission, and I shot up like a rocket. But I will tell you, I hung in there for a little while, and I was tempted to move away. And Robert was saying how you have this uh, honeymoon. Now, yeah, he gives you that honeymoon. It's like you're, you're walking on cloud nine with your, with your, with your beloved. And it was, it's wonderful, but it's gonna, he's going to test you to see really how sincere you are. But it's also a period of growth so that you truly become solidified and bonded in that relationship with Jesus. God always says, I always test, test my beloved because he loves you and I so much. He wants so much more for us than to just settle for mediocrity. No, we are on our way to an eternal banquet with an infinite, all-loving, all-powerful, all-romantic, all-awesome God that is going to blow you away for all eternity. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. We have no, no idea what we have in store. <clears throat> St. Paul will tell us, all the suffering in the world that you may go for compares to nothing to the eternal glory that God has in store for those who love him. Right. Go and find out. Do not miss the opportunity. Do not. Go and find right. out and tell Jesus that I want this and I don't care what you got to do, Lord. And tell him, I'm not, I, okay, I'm afraid, but tell him, Lord, remove that fear. He will do it. Go ahead, Robert. Yeah, when, uh, and, and also is a little, um, it's like a well-known secret now <laughs> where um, yeah. in this we have to, we have to understand that even when this conversion as you pray, and this grace comes to you. Um, understand your 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 sure refuge is in um, the full traditions of the Holy Roman Catholic Church, and yeah. and even within that, the, we have to learn the precepts of God. Everything Holy Mother Church offers to us to develop that true fear of the Lord, which leads to wisdom, and that wisdom will lead to obedience. And I like to read this right here, Robert, too. Um, sure, go for it. Yep. Okay. We are living in a time of great heresy where the faith is being stripped. 
where mankind is being offered up to their own passions as they did to our Lord at the scourging. My brothers and sisters, I bring you back to the scourging. Our Lord is being tortured, tortured to extreme proportion. If we would, would we take his place or would we find reasons why we would not? Would we be willing to take his place out of love for him? Would we be willing to take scourge after scourge, not for any sins of our own, but for the sins of our brothers and sisters? Would we be willing to be mocked, ridiculed, spit upon, or torn to, th to, to threads by the scourging? I ask you this, for this is what he has done for us. And how have we repaid him with our indignant ways? O oh Lord, how sorrowed we become when we are cowards to speak. For in your bitter passion, thou hast shown a courage that goes beyond all mankind, a love that defines the word of love. And thou hast become the man of sorrows as thou hast taken upon our sins, our sins that have grieved you, that have scourged you, that have caused you to lay, that lay there in the pool of your precious blood with your mother, your holy mother watching. And yet I fear to even utter your name among many believers. Give me the grace and courage that you demonstrated at the hour of your scourging, that I might be an instrument in your passion, that I might be a light that leads to you. We give you thanks, O Lord, for your great courage on our behalf. Let us never deny what you have done for us, nor ever look away, lest if we, if we look away, we will fall into the midst of darkness, never to receive your light that leads to salvation. Amen. <clears throat> you know, I would like to say, <clears throat> when we discover Jesus, we will never hunger. He always satisfies our hunger. We will never thirst. He always satisfies our thirst. You will discover in Christ, he will reveal his plan for you. It's an awesome, incredible plan, but unique to every individual. And it will never be found unless if it's found in the will of God. Seek and desire his will. You will discover the awesome plan that God has for you. You will discover how awesome you are in the eyes of God. We don't have to look awesome to anybody else in the world. But that's what envy is seeking, to look awesome in the eyes of everyone else. And we see everybody else as having more. No. No. Discover who you are in Christ. Man. Man you're going to be blown away. You're going to say, wow, God, I'm a lot more awesome than I ever thought I was. But in a holy way, not in a proud way, but in a way where you're going to discover the great plan and the great gifts, the great mission that God has for you as an individual. You're going to want to get strip yourself of the false self that we've sort of like conjured up throughout our entire life. We kind of developed a false self because we want everybody to think that we're more, more awesome than them. We, want, we don't want anybody to discover our misery. We don't want anybody to discover our faults, so we kind of mask it with a false self. And we want to imitate maybe a superhero or something, which is it's fine, it's good, but make Jesus your superhero. You will discover how awesome you are. And then what will happen is he'll heal us over time with the help of his grace, with practice, with working along, doing what he tells us. We will discover our true selves, and you will be so happy to have discovered your true self. You will have so much confidence in yourself because you will be your true self. And you're going to say, man, I'm pretty awesome. God, you made me something very special. I guarantee it. This is what's going to happen. You know, and uh, one other thing I want to mention, too, 
is uh, the Lord gave me a dream a couple of weeks ago, and in my dream, it makes sense, you know. It wasn't like this fireworks dream, but it really makes sense, where I saw this enormous snake, big, fat, long serpent, serpent. And these people, most, many of them adults, were breastfeeding from the serpent, nursing off a serpent, breastfeeding. In other words, they were drinking the milk of a snake, a viper, poisonous, wretched, vicious. But they were nursing, and they were content. And the, and the serpent made them feel coddled and warm and comfortable and protected and safe and doing the right thing and made them feel content. But, oh, my goodness, are we getting fat on the milk of a serpent? Because if we are, we will become a brood of vipers. Remember St. Uh, uh, um, John the Baptist, you brood of vipers. He was talking to the crowds and the chief priests because they're nursing from the serpent. They're not breastfeeding from the Holy Mother Church and the way they ought to be. Right, right. And I took this huge knife, like a sword, and I plunged it into the serpent, and I killed it. And man, these people that were nursing from the serpent, boy, were they ticked off at me. Because I took away their contentment, and they made me feel like the worst of human beings. How could you do that to us? I felt guilty. I felt uh, like I've lost uh, friendship. But you know what? That's the sword of truth destroying the serpent, the false, the liar, the serpent. But what, what are we doing to nurse from the serpent? Well, how much time do we spend with God? Or do we spend eight, ten hours on the television? How much time do we spend reading scripture or do we read uh, smut books or all kinds of uh, fake news, fake novels, whatever? How much time do we spend before the Blessed Sacrament or are we spending too many hours before television or video games or sports? This is all nursing from the serpent, folks. We're not being fed with true milk. Where do we get the true milk, the sacraments? Go ahead, yes. Robert. Yeah, and uh, the, the other thing, too, is not only what we do there, but even, even um, um, we must test every spirit. Even that's why we need to know our faith. It's almost like to, 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 when we start out, um, you can go to the catechism of the Catholic Church, yes, but definitely go to the Baltimore Catechism first, too. Mm -hmm. It gives the nuts and bolts of the faith and tells you what it is. And it's less uh, philosophical, I say, say, at times, whatever. But but it's the nuts and bolts. But but it's almost like, um, and plus, there's many things that are going on that are very lukewarm. Even even uh, what we see sometimes our churches is if Jesus isn't even there, he's in the he's in the center of his kingdom. Right. But it's almost. Right. I'd like to read this right now too. Um, this sure. ties in what you're saying. How much sorrow must have come to our Lord's heart? when he saw the Jewish high priests witnessing the scourging with no repentance in their hearts. We would believe it would have been enough to see the brutal scourging, for it was so brutal that he was unrecognizable, and without a doubt he had to call on his divine nature just to survive it. Yet when our Lord was found to still be alive, it frustrated them, and they would soon order the crowd to order his crucifixion. And like sheep being led to a, a slaughterhouse, they did what the chief priest had asked them. How sad it is that one can be swayed to do wrong as if reality did not exist. One may question, how can one be led into such darkness as to call for the crucifixion of our Lord? Thus I answer you. Throughout history, evil men have risen to power that has caused tremendous suffering those who seek worldly power will do, say, or promise anything to obtain it, even if they have to come against God himself. When one who is evil obtains power over people, they can bring wars of great destruction. They can cause nations to be separated from God. 
worthy of God's punishment. They can place into laws the abomination of abortion that has scourged our Lord terribly. Then can, they can eliminate prayer from our schools and assemblies. They can provide every abomination that comes against our Lord and many follow him. There can be no wonder why the world will be scourged with punishment. How blind many have become. Crucify him, crucify him. So many who have obtained power cry out, crucify him, crucify him. Though not by words, but by actions. Just look at the blood that will flow of these little children, these little babies, and how in our taxpayer money will be funded for it. And even if the baby comes from the womb and survives the abortion, it must still die. Crucify him. Crucify him. And where is anyone speaking out about it? Where are our our leaders speaking out about it? The high priests wished to obtain their worldly status. Thus our Lord became a threat to the high priests who were politically connected. And with their actions, they cast down our Lord to be crucified. When a nation leaders, when a nation's leaders cast down our Lord for self-gain, it comes with a wave of suffering. Look how the Jewish people have, allowed, have been allowed to suffer. They are waiting for our Lord to come, to set them free. Yet he has come, and they refuse to, let, list, to recognize him. Be blessed, my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. For even after the horrifying scourging, still, you still can recognize him within your heart. Though your sins have added to the number of scourges, he recognizes thy love that we have for him. Brothers and sisters, we cannot let our Lord scourge and pass from our memory. It should always encourage us to endure with patience and humility any trial or tribulation that could confront us, whether it be on the spiritual level, physical level, or mental. And it would be good for us to practice this. When we deserve gratification for doing unto others, seek to deprive ourselves of it. Speak not of the words that we have done well. Offer this as an act of penance and and atonement for the scourges we have caused our Lord, especially the sins of the flesh, that cost our Lord so dearly. My brothers and sisters, our Lord denied his own will for us as he suffered the scourging. Thus it would be good for us to do the same. We should practice self-denial, for this is so evidently lacking in the world today. Our Lord lays upon the ground for us, bloodied by the scourging, and his mother watches. His precious blood splattered, all around us. Thus we should not allow our lives to become a place of comfort of self, but a place of self-denial that unselfishly gives of oneself, for this is what our Lord has done for us. Self-denial and mortification is what strips us of the things of this world and allows us to be open to those blessings that God seeks to give us. My brothers and sisters, we must always ask ourselves, how can I take pleasure in the very sin for which our Lord has bitterly, was bitterly scourged? It is a question we all must ask ourselves every time we find ourselves entering into sin. Are we going to call for our Lord's scourging to continue? Or are we going to kneel down beside our Blessed Mother and be His and her con- con- consolers? I take to you life. I take to you to your life. For here we have blacked out. So we're totally blacked out for a time. Then all of a sudden we awake. We find the scourging instrument in our hands. Are we going to scourge him with our sins? Or are we going to wash away our sins in his precious blood and cleanse his wounds with our tears? It is our free will that will decide this. 
we can be one of the crowd who calls for his scourging, his crucifixion, or we can be one who loves him with the precious love that our Blessed Mother has for him. Forgive us, O Lord, for we are weak and our sins have scourged you. Let my life change more fully. Let my temptations descend fast from my heart and guide me along the path that leads to the kingdom of heaven. Allow my tears to be the tears of sincerity, not a love that is on the surface, but a love that is profoundly in our hearts. <clears throat> Teach us how to love, how to become a lover of self-denial, that I may comfort you in these painful hours of discouraging. In thy bitter scourging, I recognize thy infinite love, and I long to love thee. Teach me how to love, that I may never decide for love of this world ever again. Amen. Amen. Wow. There's a lot in there. And uh, sobering. It's very sobering. And um, how do we come to love God? How do we come to love Jesus? Well, to come to love anybody, we need to get to know them. You can't possibly, we can't possibly love anyone or anything without knowing them. Can't. I can't say I, I, I love this woman way out in California. I want to marry her, but I don't know who she is. <laughs> we need to get to know our Lord. How do we do that? Sacred Scripture. Saint, that's one way. Saint Jerome says ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. Read the life of Christ. Read the whole Bible from cover to cover, especially the Gospels. We're talking about when you read the life of Jesus, the life of Mary, the life of the apostles. Literally place yourself in that scene. You're walking with Jesus when you read Scripture. Put yourself there. Act as if you were one of the people there with him. And he is talking to you. He's talking to your heart. He's guiding you. The sacraments, the Eucharist, you receive him into the very core of your being. He becomes our food. The body, blood, soul, and divinity becomes our food. We're always feeding on the, on the Lord, quenching our thirst. That's why he calls himself the life-giving water, the Holy Spirit. He is the vine. We are the branches. We are drinking from the sap of the vine. We're being nourished. He is our food. And the best way we can consume our Lord is through Holy Communion. And that's where the wedding feast the bridegroom and the bride, you and I, the church, where the wedding is consummated, consummated by receiving right. Holy Communion. We consummate the marriage that way. So those are some of the ways. Also, I want to mention, read the lives of the saints, what they were prior to their conversion and after, and how our Lord led them to great heights of sanctity and how they had to deny themselves. You know, you'll discover it's not as hard as you think. He gives us the grace, and our Lord says, Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. But learn of me, for I am meek and humble of heart. We must humble ourselves before his infinite majesty and know that he is God, and he will take care of it all. One last thing I'd like to say is where your heart, where your treasure is, there is where your heart will be. Is Jesus our treasure? Or you could always discover by whom one worships. Just listen to what they talk about all the time. Just listen to how much time they spend in this activity or activity. Whatever they do most with their time or talk about or involved in, that's what they worship. That's who we worship. I'm not saying all these things are bad. These things are very good. They can be used, but provided they're used to bring you closer to God and not further away. But we need to balance, we need to balance the time to where, or I should rather say rightly order it, where you're spending most of your time with our Lord getting to know him. This is the things that we need to detach from. And this is the whole meaning, what it means to convert. 
one thing at a time. Ask the Holy Spirit, ask Our Lady, ask the saints, seek the sacraments, to strengthen the sacraments, read Scripture, whatever you need to do. Get into prayer. Ask our Lord for the grace to wean us off of these things. Because we could be nursing from that serpent. God wants us to wean off of that and start drinking real milk so we can discover yeah. who we truly are. Go ahead, Robert. Very good. Very good. Uh, I don't know if you have time, but I could, I could um, to, to sure. tap it off. Yeah, we've got... It would, yeah, tap it off, yeah. and then, yeah, that's good. Perfect. Okay, what, what I want to do, is it's just, it's just kind of short, but uh, what I want to say before I play this is... Um, is we talked about uh, the the COVID and the mask, wearing the mask and oxygen. And like Robert has yeah. said about the Holy Eucharist, St. Padre Pio said the earth could exist easier without the sun than without the Holy Eucharist. Right. And in relation to the sun, the sun, you know, brings forth the trees and the trees bring forth oxygen. So God is like oxygen and he knows your every moment of your life. So he's going to try and nurture, and we're praying so, so we can all be led back to him. But here I'm going to play this, and here it is. In the splendorous creation of God, he created the splendorous oxygen that sustains you upon the earth. Reflect upon the splendorous oxygen that God has created and see how essential the oxygen is, for it sustains life for creatures upon the earth. And it sustains life for all mankind upon the earth. I call you to fill your lungs with oxygen and contemplate the masterful creator who created that breath that you have taken. Reflect upon the splendorous oxygen as God sees all things that you have done and that you have failed to do. I ask you, can a man of good health escape from the splendorous oxygen? If a man should journey a great distance away from his home, the oxygen will remain with him at all times. If a man of good health hides in a crowd and tries to escape from the oxygen, this is impossible. For the splendorous oxygen will be with each one individually in the crowd. If a man tries to hide in his sin, the splendorous oxygen will be with him, just as the splendorous oxygen is with you at all times. So too is the divine creator, who is divinely just. If you take the Lord's name in vain, the divine master knows. If you kill, the divine master knows. If you burn in the flame of lust, the divine master knows. If you bear false witness, the divine master knows. If you steal, the divine master knows. If you covet thy neighbor's wife, the divine master knows. If you seek the world, the divine master knows. All brothers and sisters shall be judged according to what they have done and what they have failed to do. I ask you again to fill your lungs with the splendorous oxygen and know that God is with you even as you fill your lungs with the splendorous oxygen. Can a world be so blind as to not see what I have spoken? It is time. It has always been time to flee the immoral ways of the blinded world and come into the light of eternal life, Christ Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, who has redeemed the world through his holy cross. What I give to you is truth, but they are only words if they are not taken to heart. Can a blind man be a blind man? Much of the world's leaders have become blinded by power, and in their blindness, they lead others into blindness. It is Christ Jesus who leads you into the eternal light of salvation. So follow him, who has sent me to proclaim his greatness. In this time of darkness, I call you to be docile and have unconditional reverence for the super substantial bread that comes down from heaven as a sacrifice of the altar, the Holy Eucharist, which is the true presence of the Lamb of God who has redeemed the world. May you live in the super substantial grace of the Holy Eucharist. Amen.
Amen. Wow, that was beautiful. Very, very beautiful. It uh, sounds very Franciscan because he really saw God in nature and and saw, saw all that God has given us in nature to help us to come to know God. So that's another way of coming to know God is just meditate and try to find him in nature. Even in our neighbor, even if they have many, many faults and sins and they could be, um, an, uh, what, do you, what do you call it, an irritable person, look for something good in them and build off of that. There always is something of the light of God in every person, no matter how wicked they are. Believe it or not, find that goodness in them and build off of it and try to your best to ignore everything else and forgive those that have hurt you forgive your neighbors love your neighbors this is the gospel of jesus love one another as i have loved you love your neighbors do good to your enemies do good to those who persecute you pray for those who curse you this is the way of god the way of life do not follow the way of death the culture of death it's always cursing and scandalizing and uh, bearing false witness against their neighbor for personal gain. See, they haven't found the pearl of great price. They envy everyone. They want to attain all of this power, obtain power. All the money in the world can never satisfy the greedy. Just look at the billionaires, the, peop the, the filthy wealthy on earth. They, the world ain't enough. They want to own the entire world to themselves. Do you see where greed takes that voracious appetite of the godless, the atheists? So Jesus truly is the only one that can satisfy. Why? Because the human heart is an infinite void. And I mean that. It's an infinite void. And all, what good is it to gain the whole world if you fill in that void with the whole world but lose your soul in the process? Because all these things in the world are perishing. The only thing that can satisfy that voracious, empty, infinite void is the love and mercy of an infinite God. That's it, folks. Get rid of all of this worldliness as best as you can. Even if you fall back, uh, I mean, there's certain things that just, just so you know, the, the, the hopefulness in God's mercy, there are certain sins that I am struggling to get rid of in my life. I am desperately trying everything I can, doing whatever I can, at least I think I am, trying to rid myself of certain habitual addictive sins. Not always easy. And I, and I fail. I fail. I'm very unsuccessful. But what I do rely on is God's mercy is available to me whenever I need it. And when I fall, he instantly grants it to me if I make a sincere act of contrition and beg him for his mercy, make an appeal to his mercy, and he grabs me by the hand like he grabbed Peter when he sank walking on the water and he pulls him up out of that water. That's what Jesus does. But do not give up the fight and do not get despair because the devil wants you to despair. Even if you fall, I am going to continue fighting against every sin and rid myself of that. I, gar I promise you because there's nothing more than I want to be fulfilled and healed and perfected in Christ. And, you know, the funny thing is, even though I may fall in certain sins uh, of my life that are addictive or whatever, I'm, I'm just so weak, I discover the mercy of God, and the more, the more he grants me his mercy, the more I fall in love with him. Mercy itself. Because I'm constantly being immersed and having a deep encounter with mercy itself. Interiorly, it's an experience of mercy. There's no better way to learn than to experience God's infinite mercy. Let him into your hearts, folks. Reach out to Jesus. Call out to him, my my Jesus Master, have mercy on me, pity on me. What is it you want me to do for you? I want to see. I want to be healed. If you will it, Lord, you can heal me. And Jesus says, I do will it. But you've got to reach out to him. Ask and you shall receive. Knock, the door will be open. Seek and you shall find. Guarantee the words of our Lord, our beloved Jesus, who loves you and I with an infinite love. 
And if you don't believe me, just one day go into a church and look at a crucifix. You're seeing love itself die for you and me, and he would do it over again a million times, infinite number of times, if, if the infinite wisdom of God, his Father, would permit it. He would do it. That's how much he loves you and I. Any last thoughts, Robert, and we'll close it out today. I think that's 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 quite a bit of meat <laughs> to receive. Okay, Robert. To God. Yes, as always, I can't help it, but I'm just so I have such a zeal for souls, and um, I just want them to experience the same joy, you know. So, but anyways, God love you all. Uh, tune in again, please, and uh, Robert and I will be back sooner than you think. May God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you all through the heart of Mary, in union with St. Joseph. Bless you and your families and bring peace, unity, healing, forgiveness, conversion. Seek out the heart Amen. of Jesus. He loves you. God bless you. Amen. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.